Funny or Die has taken over this movie. Tonight, conversations with Pigeon Man. Hey, I'm Pigeon Man. Join me for some stimulating conversation. Or not, I don't give a Mr. Drummond warns it's about to get very real in this bitch. Buckle up. The fam's returning bikes after a ride. Mr. Horton comes out juggling. He used to juggle knives in the circus. Not a troubling backstory at all. He says instead of renting, Mr. Drummond should buy a bike. Sounds good to Arnold. Mr. Drummond doesn't like the idea of Arnold riding around town. There are a lot of creepy weirdos. Arnold says a bike now is a great investment. He's going to be this size forever. Mr. Horton shows Arnold a fresh red bike. He loves it. He can wear a red helmet with red pants and pronounce C's like B so people know where he bums from. Mr. Drummond says it'll make a fine birthday gift. Mr. Horton tells Arnold if if he passes out these flyers, he'll give him a nifty radio. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You keep coming up with these presents, you can scratch me all over. <laughs> he might just take you up on that, Arnold. Arnold is unsuccessfully distributing these opposite of treasure maps. Dudley shows him how a real salesman does it, then wants in on the offer to hand out a pedophile's leaflets for a free radio. Arnold announces he gave out all the flyers. That is great, Arnold. You're sure some terrific passer out it. <laughs> I have a way with words when I put my mouth to it. Uh, maybe don't advertise what that mouth do. Mr. Horton says this calls for a celebration. How about a banana split in his attached apartment that features one of those arcade cabinets older men are known to have loved in the 1980s. I know this is the tallest, the, the, the sweetest, the gooeyest, the stickiest, and the, the most disgusting banana split I think I've ever made. That checks out. Most of his disgusting sticky messes aren't very tall at all. The way I eat it, it won't have a chance to melt. My tongue's faster than a hummingbird's wings. Arnold, please say less right now. Mr. Horton says it sucks. Arnold's dad won't give him the bike until his birthday. But if he wants to swing by after school, he can ride that red thing. Maybe take the bike for a spin, too. But do not tell Dad Dada about the bike. Matter of fact, don't tell Dada shit. Arnold tells Dudley the awesome news that Mr. Horton has toys and trains and video games. It's like Michael Jackson's house. Just like Michael Jackson's house. And he might be able to get Dudley in on the banana-shaped stuff-in-your-mouth action. Mr. Horton sees his young guests and plants some porn between comic books. <laughs> Very weird laugh track. He invites them into his sad apartment for pizza. He says the za is cooking, but he needs to go to the front, so peruse his well-stocked literature in the meantime. Arnold's mind is blown. That's a titty. That's a titty. Whole book full of titty. Mr. Horton catches them and says, it's all good. A little titty never hurt no one. The human body is a work of art. Now here's some pizza with a not-so-subtle sales pitch on the side. You know, guys, you can just have an awful lot of fun with your clothes off. Unless, of course, you live at the North Pole. And gonna freeze your tush off. <laughs> very, very weird laugh track. He says skinny dipping is fun. Here are pictures of him swimming naked with kids to prove it. Dudley says it looks like a party. Arnold is not about that life. Mr. Horton asks if these young adults want a little wine with their pizza, like in France or Michael Jackson's house. Arnold says no way, but when Dudley says yup, Arnold refuses to let him drink alone true friendship. Mr. Horton says, let's play Instagram. Dudley can be Tarzan, but Tarzan never wore a shirt. Better pop that thing off, Dudster. Now let's take some pictures, drink some wine, have a good time to be continued right now. Horton says Tarzan needs a lion. He volunteers. He loves lying to kids. But first, more jungle juice. Arnold says no thanks. That stuff nasty. But when Dudley calls him a punk, Arnold says pour up drink. <laughs> <laughs> Close enough. Horton invites them to jump on his twin-sized mattress, an underdog contender for top five saddest things about this episode. He says they can use his nickname, Curly, a nickname for his hair, just not the ones on his head. A customer arrives. It's Mr. Drummond. He tries to pay for the bike, but can't take the hint to scram from Horton's horny ass. Arnold sees his daddy talking to the guy he lives with and books it out the back with Dudley in a fistful of gum. Arnold gets busted by Kimberly and Willis with a mouthful of minty chew. They ask why he smells like Kiefer Sutherland's pool house. He says it's just wine. Dudley's dad gave it to him. And what's the big deal? Everyone drinks wine in France. But he's not in France or Michael Jackson's house, and if dad finds out, he's going to whoop his ass. Arnold feels bad about all the sneaking. Mr. Horton has some cartoons that might change his mind. Arnold's not convinced. Oh, that's all right, Dudley. That just means that there's more, uh, Boston cream pie for you and me. <laughs> Boston cream pie? <laughs> Let's pray to God he's talking about dessert and not a road trip. Mr. Horton puts on the tunes. The mouse just lost his pants. <laughs> and he's not wearing any undershorts. <laughs> Look at that girl mouse. She's wearing a bikini. <laughs> not anymore. 
very, very, very weird laugh track. This vintage hentai finally exceeds Arnold's capacity for bullshit. He's taking his cream pie to go. Mr. Horton says now they can play Neptune. It's a water game in the shower. Dudley's gonna love it. Dudley's dad swings by the Drummond residence. He politely requests they stop sending Dudley home sauced. Yesterday he came home smelling like Nick Nolte's Golden Globes tuxedo. Mr. Drummond denies the allegations. Willis and Kimberly spill beans. They say Arnold came home schmambammed, but claimed he got loose at Dudley's house. Dudley is going to talk with his son. Mr. Drummond is going to go whoop Arnold's ass. Time to tackle the serious topic of preteen alcoholics. He came to discuss something that I found quite informative. Oh, what's that? You and Dudley hitting the bottle. What you talking about, Dad? <laughs> Nailed it. Mr. Drummond wants a name. Arnold fingers Horton, which is not the way Horton hoped things would go. He gave us some pizza and wine. What else went on there? He showed us some pictures. Everybody was naked. <laughs> ha ha. Naked? And he showed us some kinky cartoons. <laughs> ha ha. What do you mean by kinky? Well, you told me about the birds and the bees, but that's nothing compared to what those mice were doing. <laughs> Ha uh, ha ha. Mr. Drummond calls 5-0 and brings them to Horton's den of Schwinn. Busted, you sweatered sicko. Dudley says Horton gave him a pill to feel good, but he does not feel good. At first it was fun, then Mr. Horton tried to touch him. His dad says it's not his fault, and he loves him, then makes a face that says, God damn, you white people. Arnold doesn't know who to trust anymore. Mr. Drummond says you can still trust most people, even like three of the white ones. But watch out for adults who tell you to keep secrets from your parents or lavish you with gifts and wine, even if they made Thriller. So what did we learn today? Stay the hell away from bike shops. Because the nice old man running them might try to feed your kid ice cream and wine, then show him pictures of his saggy old balls and photograph his best friend without a shirt on. And if someone offers you a free radio, you're better off just buying the damn thing and saving yourself a lot of stress and therapy. And it doesn't matter what people do in France, because we are not in France or Michael Jackson's house. See you next time on a very special episode. Another boring day at Rachel's place when, oh snap, the dragons. Thugs on a mission to make teen spill fries led by a young man rocking a chain like a beauty pageant sash. Dragon Deluxe requests a table because all this shoving and chain wearing has the team hungry as heck. Eddie tells them to get out before they make this show interesting. And what if we don't? But I have to get tough. Very convincing, Ed. Laura says, get out. But now the dragon leader isn't just hungry, he's thirsty too. His name is Chain, like Sting, Madonna, or future Beyonce. Laura throws up a sass force field, but Chain is into the sass. He invites her to a movie, but when she says no, he goes in for a very sad chin squeeze. Denied. Chain doubles down on that chin squeeze, very sad. Urkel is done playing. He prepares for an ass beating, more specifically, his. But because Chain doesn't need a murder charge, he has Venti Dragon hang Urkel on Chicago's strongest coat stand. And Rachel wants to know what the hell is going on. Chain, mistaking this diner for a dating app, swipes right on another hottie, even if she's a little old. Oh. Oh no, you did not. Rachel says hit the road with that old shit. Eddie has her back. And Laura. And so is my friend Waldo. Waldo is not trying to die today. Shane says they're being rude, and when you're rude to customers, bad stuff happens. Whoopsie daisy. Rachel threatens to call the police, the rudest shit you can do, and Shane calls for some synchronized whoopsie daisying. Enter Carl. Carl says, get out. Go read Lord of the Rings or watch kung fu movies or whatever the hell made you name your dumb gang after mythical winged creatures. Laura and Rachel are telling everyone the uneventful story. Richie's demonstrating how he would have put his size three Velcros up some dragon butt. Ring, ring. Return of the snap. The dragons fucked Rachel's place, uh, boy, whoopsie daisy city. And these nerds had the audacity to leave a doodle on the wall. Rachel demands Carl arrest these doodling dorks. Carl says he's gonna, but they'll be back on the streets in five minutes when their friends come forward with rock solid alibis that they were watching subs not dubs anime at Terry's house. So these hoodlums can just do whatever they want and get away with it? Well, I wouldn't go that far. I would. Uh, was Eddie standing outside the door waiting for just the right moment? What a drama queen. The dragons fucked Eddie's face uh, boy. He says eight of them jumped him after his date with an imaginary woman, then slapped him around like a car in a Street Fighter bonus level. Carl is mad. How mad? Stool throwing mad. He wants street justice, but Urkel says they're going to scream police brutality and he'll lose his job as a cop. Simpler times. Steve says he knows a better way. He'll wear a wire and go undercover to record a podcast. Carl and Detective Whiteman will be his first subscribers. The dragons are debating whether to rob a movie theater or a bowling alley because these criminal masterminds have the vision of bored nine-year-olds. Urkel bursts into their basement hang zone slash stolen TV and keyboard depot. He says it's their lucky day. He wants in on that gangbang lifestyle. And he's not the nerd they remember from eight hours ago. He's crazy. How crazy? Spilling Cheetos everywhere crazy. The guy in the mesh blouse is shook. Meanwhile, in the mobile pod 
podcast studio, Carl and his cop Cajun accidentally handcuff themselves together, who cares? Urkel eyes the dragon tag and begins his snitch cast. Did you do that great dragon at Rachel's place? Yeah, did you see that? Busted. Oh, and kudos to you on the great job you did on smashing up the place. <laughs> well, thank you. Busted. Were you together when you beat up the Winslow kids? Uh, yeah, it was a team effort. You talk too much. Get up! My, how the busted tables have turned. Shane knows something is up. He used deductive reasoning to conclude one of the two Urkels he met today is a phony, and he's inclined to say it's this leather-clad caricature asking questions about crimes. Why? Because he's wired. Urkel snitches on himself. He is wired. Come and get him, Carl. Uh, Carl? A big guy. And right when they're about to cut off his dick and feed it to his ears, Carl and Sergeant Mane save the day, hiding their handcuffed hands with a very funny walk wow who cares. And the fam toasts Urkel, because now the dragons will be playing D&D in prison for cigarettes. So what did we learn today? If a gang comes to your restaurant for cheeseburgers, maybe just give them cheeseburgers. Because when you're rude to customers, whoopsie daisies happen. And the ruder you are, the bigger the whoopsie daisy. And don't talk tough to gangs, because they will smack your shit into next Wednesday. And don't confess your many gang crimes to any bozo who walks through the door. And if you're undercover looking like fifth place in a George Michael lookalike contest, do not snitch on yourself. Because the cavalry might wait one second too long and you will get your dick cut off. And never call someone named Aunt Rachel old, or she will call the cops. See you next time on a very special episode. You're watching Funny or Die TV. And now, the shirtless painter. Painting on canvas is fun, but did you know you could also paint on a computer? and send. They're, they're no longer defined as assets, and they now become problems. I mean, I hate to do this publicly, but should we cut the books? Should we? I'm for it. Sean and Marlon are at a cool party with famous people. Marlon got Moesha's autograph. Sean and Marlon are at a party with people. Rico da Vinci arrives. Marlon says he loves his bad movies. Rico tells him to beat it, but his friend, who also shops at the Big and Tall Collar store, says that's the token black guy from that sitcom. Rico loves that sitcom and invites Marlon to the bathroom to smoke a little shimmy shimmy ya. Sean is badgering a pasty producer who perks up when he mentions he reps the token black guy from that sitcom. Supercut says he's producing the new Steven Bergman movie, and there's a perfect role for Marlon, but can Marlon handle it? Sean Sean says, duh. Marlon comes out the bathroom smelling like Snoop Dogg's Xbox on Labor Day. Sean scolds his brother for reeking of Ruth Buda Ginsburg. Marlon says, chill. He's faking. It was all past. No puff puff. Sean says he better watch it. Smoking Trill Collins can lead to other things, like waffles. Marlon dips to get waffles with Rico. Marlon wants to tell Sean all about the waffles, but he interrupts his thrilling tale to say he got him an audition with Steven Bergman. Even though Marlon almost blew it by having fun at that party, Sean cautions it's a short walk from hot box lavatories to dull stories about waffles to smoking crap. Crack. Marlon says relax, he is not ripping kush sticks, it's just pretendy Wendy make-believe. A wild kush stick appears. Sean wants to know what the heck happened to pretendy Wendy make-believe. Marlon says he only took the stone bone so his new friends would think he's cool. Sean says he does not want Marlon hanging with Rico because he's his 26 year old baby brother and he's flushing this doobie before it ruins his life. Marlon's rehearsing outside of Steven Bergman's office when Rico walks by, fresh off his latest blindfolded shopping spree. Marlon is nervous. Rico tells him to smoke a Jim Jam, take the edge off. Marlon's worried it will mess with his process. Rico says it will make him more creative. He'll be wrapping cold mac and cheese and slices of turkey at 2am. This stuff is creativity cheat codes. Marlon laments his narc brother flushed his Illmatic. Rico says no worries, he keeps a freshie of Yo Biden rolled in his pubes. Best of luck, my guy. Marlon shows up to the audition H-I-I-I-I-G-H high as hell off that diesel DeVito. Door drumming, hair ruffling high. Let's go to the Marlon cam. Ayo, that's some good shit. The only acting he's doing is acting a damn fool. Running around, rolling around high. More Marlin cam. Ooh wee. Marlin is singing into a lamp like Nate Dog High. Where does Rico cop his fuzzy green nasty? But when Marlin shows his best impression of a person skiing, not in the script, uh, something isn't right. Then he gets spooked by a poster that's looking right at him? Dear God. This is happening faster than Sean predicted. Marlin is already smoking crack. Mr. Coppertone attempts to get Marlin to read his one line, but he simply cannot. He is lit past the point of no return on what appears to be crack. And just when he's about to almost maybe act, he decides he'd rather try out for the role of Pookie in New Jack City. Then spills jelly beans on the floor 
and takes his shirt off, which would be fine if he was on mushrooms with friends in a cabin, but he's high on crack with his potential future boss in his office. The producer tells him to scram. Marlin grabs their tasty beans, deuces. Senor Sweater says drugs are a damn shame. First they fired that pothead Rico, now this high son of a bitch stole their sweet beans. Marlin says he aced it. Sean begs to differ. He did not get the part because he was cracked the fuck out. Marlin denies the allegations, then pulls a lifetime supply of jelly beans up out his nut area. Marlin says he had jitters, so he toked a little lottie dottie. Sean says not only did he lose the part, now he's got a bad reputation, just like Rico, who can't get a job because he stays blunted. And they don't even need to drug test him. They just look at his shirts and know what time it is. Marlin says this weed stuff is bad news. He is done smoking. For evs. Until 603 days from now when Scary Movie comes out and his character does nothing but get high for 88 minutes. And it ends with a direct-to-camera PSA, warning people not to mess with drugs unless you want to launch a horror film parody franchise that earns 900 million dollars at the box office. So what did we learn today? Don't get blazed before you have to do anything important, especially if you got the joint from someone you barely know because it might be laced with crack. And a little kush won't ruin your life, but way too much will have you buying ugly shirts in quantity. And only sketchy losers hide in bathrooms to smoke weed at parties, because weed is is for sharing and you're stinking up the john. And drugs are no laughing matter, just like Scary Movie 3 through 5. See you next time on a very special episode. You're watching Funny or Die TV. Boop, boop, boop. And now, Conversations with Pigeon Man. Ah! It's a cat infestation! Run for your life! Rose and Al have been dating for over a month, and Al's ready to make things boots knocking official, but they can't knock boots at Al's place, his sister's home. Rose won't let Al's horny ass in, but he talks her into letting him come in just a little, see how it feels. Rose doesn't want her roomies to know she's getting that work. Al promises he'll be extra quiet and will not make any noises that sound like an orangutan on Adderall slapboxing a trash bag full of yogurt. Rose wakes up the next morning feeling good. Dorothy says she must have had some dreams. She woke up the whole house. Rose says it was a nightmare, not an inaccurate way to describe too old slam and slippery uglies. Blanche says it sure is funny how nightmares sound just like a wild boar trying to eat 50 pounds of shredded chicken covered in jelly. Sophia says what up, then informs Rose there's a man in her bed. Rose got lucky. Not so lucky. The man in your bed is dead. <laughs> Hilarious. Sophia was putting laundry away, gave Al a what up, and got the cold shoulder, the very cold shoulder. He did. Rose says he's just shy, a claim refuted by everyone who heard his grunty grunts mere hours ago. Dorothy tells Rose to check on her dude. Rose doesn't want to wake him. Sophia says that ain't gonna happen. Savage. Dorothy volunteers to take a look at their stiff guest, but she needs a body buddy. Sophia says a little dead guy in the morning ain't no thing, because Sophia is a real one. And yep. He did. Dorothy wants to call the cops, but Rose is scared she'll catch a charge for vagicide. First things first, find Al's sister Lucille in the phone book and tell her. But tell her what? The gals suggest he died visiting. Just neglect to mention he was on a sightseeing tour of Rose's woman walls. Rose asks the Lucille in the phone book with Al's last name if she has a brother named Al. Uh, wrong number. Click. That wasn't Al's sister. That was Al's wife. Al, you dirty, dirty dog. Sophia says that's what guys like Al get. Sophia don't play. Dorothy tells Rose to do the right thing and tell this stranger you banged her husband into an early grave. Rose tries to tell Mrs. Beatty about her ass assassination, but Lucille says, let me guess. Al humped you, then Al dumped you, and now you're here to revenge tattle. No surprise, Al been cheating. Al slept with the maid on their honeymoon. Secretaries, school teachers, babysitters, neighbors. Al laid enough pipe in the South Southeastern United States to start his own oil company. Rose is flabbergasted to learn of Al's hoary, but she's not here for the Body Count Podcast. Rose reveals Al died last night of what appears to be a heart attack or possibly a fatal case of empty balls. The doctors just don't know yet. Miss Beatty says that's impossible. Al was healthy as a horse. Health was one of his top two horse-like attributes. Then things get very real. I'm talking so it can't be true, you know what I mean? If I keep talking, it isn't true. All I have to do is talk forever. Oh, God. This was the 15th episode of Golden Girls. The Golden Girls went hard as hell. Rose says it's all her fault. This is not the first time she's woken up next to six feet of morning wood. Her late husband also died in bed from PCCCC. Post-cheek clapping cardiovascular collapse. Rose vows to never date again, so her sweet loving won't murk another gent. Lucille interrupts her pouty party to remind Rose that her husband just died 
cheating with Rose. So maybe now is not the best time to make this all about you and your cursed vagina. The gals try to get Rose to come square dancing. Maybe meet a nice man. Rose doesn't want to kill again. Dorothy wonders if she'll be safe all alone. Sophia says if anyone breaks in, just sleep with the poor bastard. Sophia for three points from downtown, counted it's good. Lucille swings by to tell Rose the autopsy revealed Al's arteries were crazy clogged from his unhealthy diet. Apparently babysitters are super high in cholesterol. And despite Rose's concerns, Al probably fucking killed himself. Lucille's just glad he he died with a roof over his head next to a caring person, doing what he loved, banging randoms. Rose has her first date since Al, but she is spooked. Blanche tells her to take a deep breath, relax, and go do some ho shit, because it's the goddamn weekend, and weekends are for ho shit. The gals want details. Rose says they fucked. Then Ernie died. Then the sheriff showed up, and she told him men die after sleeping with her. So the sheriff said prove it. Then they fucked. And then the sheriff died. Psych. She was just goofing about the deaths. She really did get busy with a man named Ernie and also a sheriff, but it was a consensual party and everyone had a blast, especially the guy who filmed it. So what did we learn today? If a man refuses to take you back to his place for booty time, he's probably hiding a wife. And relationships are complicated. A woman can get cheated on her entire marriage and still stand by and love her dirty dog dead husband. And don't blame yourself if you wake up one morning and your partner in slime doesn't, even if it happens twice in your life, which admittedly is a bit odd. Because people die every day and vagina Vagina curses aren't real. You just gotta pick yourself up and go do some ho shit on the weekends, because weekends are for ho shit. See you next time on a very special episode.